moderating this debate, first thing I need to tell you is to turn off all cell phones so we don't have any distracting noises during the debate. Um, and I also want, as a preliminary matter, thank the law school's Hyatt Fund and the Law Students for Social Justice who organized this debate, especially Andrew Cunningham, who is in charge of getting uh, the great speakers we have here today um, and setting up this whole program. Now, just by way of introduction, I want to say a few words. Um, the death penalty, obviously, is one of the most important issues that confronts the criminal justice system today, not just because it's the most severe punishment that we have in the criminal justice system, but also because litigation over the death penalty has affected all other aspects of the criminal justice system, non-capital as well as capital cases. It's also a very emotional subject. Of course, first of all, there have been the many exonerations, people released from death row uh, after witnesses have recanted, prosecutors have admitted that they withheld exculpatory evidence, or DNA tests have disproven the prosecution's case. At the same time, despite all of this, support for the death penalty remains very high, not just in this country, but also in Europe, where supposedly the death penalty is illegal. Well, not supposedly. In fact, it is prohibited. So a debate about the death penalty is particularly timely, uh, especially since, as many of you may know, uh, unless there's a stay granted or the governor commutes the sentence, tomorrow will be the execution for John Allen Muhammad, the mastermind of the 2002 sniping incident in Washington, D.C., which left 10 people dead. Um, for today's debate, we are very fortunate to have two very well-known advocates for their respective positions. Uh, they're extremely knowledgeable about the death penalty and veterans are debating its pros and cons. Advocating for the death penalty will be, uh, excuse me, for against the death penalty will be Dr. Ken Haas. And I want to tell you a few words about him. Uh, he's from the University of Delaware. He received his PhD in political science from Rutgers University in 78. He's taught at Delaware ever since, and now has joined appointments in sociology and criminal justice, as well as political science and international relations. He's won more teaching awards at the University of Delaware than any other professor in the history of the University of Delaware. He's the author of several books having to do with criminal justice, um, and his scholarly work has been cited in many books and journal articles, and by the United States Supreme Court. Uh, on the other side of the debate is Joshua Marquis, who served as district attorney of uh, Class Op County, Oregon, since 1994. He's a former president of the Oregon District Attorneys Association and has served on the board of directors of the National District Attorneys Association since 1997. Uh, he was actually a criminal defense attorney for quite some time and represented three defendants in capital murder cases while he was a defense attorney. But of course, now he's a prosecutor. He's been a frequent guest on national radio and television programs where he's discussed the legitimacy of the death penalty. Uh, he's spoken at the, at the United States Senate, European Parliament, and so on, and he's appeared on NBC's Dateline, as well as Good Morning America, The Rivera Show, and National Public Radio. So, this is the way the debate format will proceed. Um, each individual will speak from five to seven minutes, laying out their general position, and then we'll allow one or two rebuttal by each speaker. So we may have one or two exchanges after the initial presentation, and then with about 20 minutes left, we'll open up the floor for questions, and then with about five minutes left, we will take the vote. And probably most of you know, we are going to engage in the voting process in a way that's a little bit different than normal. We're not gonna ask for people to raise hands. Rather, we're gonna follow the Oxford format, which means that if you believe that Dr. Haas made the best argument, this is not, by the way, a decision about what your preconceptions are about the death penalty. You, you are voting on who made the best arguments, not whether you agree or disagree with the death penalty. It was who was the best debater. If you believe Dr. Haas was the best debater, you go through this door on your left, which sort of makes sense. If you believe the anti-death penalty position wins, <laughs> you go to the left. If, on the other hand, you believe that Mr. Marquise was the best debater, you go out that door over there. And we'll do that with about five minutes left. Now, the first presenter will be Mr. Marquis. Um, that was determined by a coin flip. We flipped a dime and it came up heads, so Mr. Marquis will be the first speaker. Without further ado, Mr. Marquis. Thank you. My name is Josh Marquis. I'm the district attorney in, in Clatsop County. Most of you probably have no idea where that is. If you've watched movies uh, like Kindergarten Cop, The Goonies, Free Willy, it's all filmed there. Um, at, Oh, I'm, and by the way, I'm, I'm going first because Professor Haas won the coin toss. Um, <laughs> I always prefer to be in the rebuttal, but, uh, and, and we've agreed to, to try to keep our opening statements as brief as possible so there's as much interchange. I want to put one thing, I want to start right off 
and I'm not going to hold you this. Those of you who are opposed to the death penalty, would you raise your hands? Okay, roughly two-thirds of the audience. That's generally, I, I debate this um, for both the Federal Society and the American Constitution Society around, around the country, and that's, that's pretty standard. That, of course, is the exact flip-flop of the general support in the American population, which, depending on how you ask the question, runs between 65 and 80%. The way Gallup asks the question is, do you think murderers deserve the death penalty? If you were to ask me that question, I would say no, generally not. Um, I've been handling capital prosecutions for 19 years, and I've st stood before juries only twice uh, and asked them to put someone to death. One, the same defendant, twice, the jury said yes twice, and the other, uh, a defendant where the, where the jury said no. So the death penalty is a, although it's an extremely emotional subject, it is a penalty that should be very rarely sought, rarely asked for, rarely imposed. And in fact, that is the case. Uh, since the modern era of capital punishment, Greg versus Georgia, in 1976, there have been roughly, unfortunately, about 700,000 murders in the United States. Slightly over 1,000 people have been executed. Now, if you were to ask me, I would suggest that many of the people on death row shouldn't be there, not because I think they're innocent, but because I don't think their crimes are heinous enough. The idea is that the worst of the worst. Now, when you ask the question, the Gallup question side, do you think murderers deserve the death penalty? Again, generally not. Most, in fact, of all crimes, uh, murder is the least, one of the least likely to recidivate. Most murderers are not going to commit that crime again. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you ask, the, and 65% roughly of Americans right now answer that question, yes. It was up to about 80% in the 1980s when crime was really bad, and, and it came down for a variety of reasons. If, on the other hand, you ask the question, is there any crime for which you think the death penalty is appropriate? You get about 80 to 85 percent. My wife's a good example. She's very much an agnostic on the death penalty. Is not very fond of the fact that I go around the country talking about it. You know, I was a journalism undergraduate. The first thing they do in journalism school is make you write your own obituary, uh, which at 19 is usually not very interesting. So you're supposed to project out. I do not want my obituary to read Joshua Marquis, 92 prominent death penalty proponent. Um, I've I, I care very much about victims' rights, animal cruelty, uh, DUII, a lot of other things. I'm just willing to talk about this, which is, which is why I'm here. Um, and to disabuse you of the idea that this is a right-left issue, I've never voted for a Republican for national office in my life, uh, and, and don't expect to. This is not a right-left conservative re re Republican issue. In fact, the, the position of President Obama is that there are some cases in which the death penalty should be imposed. What has happened in this country is very interesting, because in Oregon, we've popularly abolished and reinstated the death penalty four times just in the 20th century. We do, we're a very populous state in Oregon. And most recently reinstated it in the late 70s. I remember when I was 12 putting a bumper sticker on my dad's car, who was a professor at the University of Oregon, that said abolish the death penalty. Um, and, and at that time, 65% of Oregonians thought it ought to be abolished. Um, there are about 36 people in Oregon's death row. Only two of them have been executed, and they are what, in the vernacular, we call volunteers, meaning people who say, I want to waive my appeals, like Tim McVeigh. Uh, Mr. Mohammed, for example, who may be executed tomorrow, um, is not a volunteer, although he has made some rather bizarre statements like that he wants to be executed so that an innocent black man will be executed in the United States. Mr. Muhammad killed 10 people. And we all know, we all know Mr. Muhammad's name. Very few of us know the names of their victims. Uh, and, and that's one of the things in the debate I think that needs to be talked about. Um, originally, the debate in America about the death penalty was, is it moral? And if you believe that the death penalty is wrong for moral or religious or philosophical reasons, there is nothing I can say that is going to change your mind. There is nothing morally superior about my position than yours or Professor Haas's. So in about 1995, a guy named Richard Dieter at the Death Penalty Information Center, very well funded by a, a number of people, the guy who owns Progressive Insurance, George Soros, some other people who are against the death penalty, changed the debate and said, okay, well, maybe the death penalty is appropriate, but it's racist. People who uh, face the death penalty get inadequate counsel. And the biggest one of all, what about innocent people being executed, which is a very legitimate concern. 
And I will tell you as a death penalty prosecutor, innocent people have been on death row. Uh, probably 36 in the, in the, since, since 1976. Now, I would argue to you that the number of innocent people that have been executed is zero. There is a case right now that I really don't know the answer to that was written about in the New Yorker, uh, a guy named Willingham who, who was convicted of the arson murder of his children. But until Mr. Willingham's case, the, the, the great innocent person acquitted was a man named Roger Coleman who was on the cover of Time magazine. He was executed in 1992 for the murder of Wanda McCoy. Victims' names matter. She was 19 years old. She was his sister-in-law. He raped and murdered her. And the state of Virginia, as in Mr. Muhammad, executes people relatively quickly. Uh, he committed the murder in 1980. He was actually executed 12 years later. Uh, the guy I have on death row in Oregon has been there for uh, 19 years, and we're about to do trial number four in March. Even if he's given the death penalty, I suspect he will outlive me. In Roger Coleman's case, he went to his death claiming that he was innocent, and someday people would realize it. In 2006, the outgoing governor of Virginia, Mark Warner, uh, in, governor, in Virginia governors can only serve one term, um, agreed to test this one last tiny remaining bit of DNA. And their nightline gathered, and Jim McCloskey, who runs something called Centurion Ministries, who believed totally in Roger, was going to have this big rollout. January 2006, the answer came down. The Canadian lab, without really, well, one in 19 million chance that he was not, in fact, the killer of Wanda McCoy. Now, does the fact that one person, in fact, who claimed not to be guilty, was guilty, um, make the death penalty okay? No, it does not. But um, I don't know how I'm doing on time. I got one minute. I'll, I'll end with uh, asking you to read a paper by someone who is in, currently before the Senate uh, named Cass Sunstein. He's a, a very progressive law professor at the University of Chicago. He's a friend of the president. Um, and he wrote a paper in 2005 called, Is Capital Punishment Morally Required? A Life for Life Trade-Off. And Cass Sunstein is not a hardcore death penalty supporter. In fact, I think he may even personally be against the death penalty. But his point was this. A series of studies in the last 10 years have shown that the deterrent value of the death penalty actually exists. And this is done by non-ideological, in many cases, regression economists. That for every death sentence, 17 murders plus or minus 7 are prevented. And Sunstein's point, very controversial, is if we, if, the death penalty actually prevents hundreds of people from being murdered. How can you not have it? And I'll end by saying that I support capital punishment in the same way I support abortion. I don't think abortion's a good idea, but I think it's a choice. I think it's sometimes a necessity. I think it's something that should be available. And my position is the same on the death penalty. Thank you. Dr. Haas? Okay. Well, we are going to see some confusion of ideological labels uh, because uh, I have frequently voted for Republicans. Uh, I consider myself one of the more conservative faculty at the University of Delaware or in the American Academy generally. And it's my position, in fact, that uh, opposition to capital punishment is basically, truly, a conservative position. At least if we define conservatism in terms of the work of Edmund Burke or the great Russell Kirk, not in terms of uh, idiots like Bill O'Reilly or Glenn Beck, uh, <laughs> who are not conservatives, but uh, radical dummies. Uh, uh, and uh, in fact, I don't like to think about obituaries because I'm a little older than Josh, but I, I would hate it if my obituary were to say and focus that, uh, oh, Ken Haas is best known for being a liberal bleeding heart crybaby who shed tears for murderous killers. Uh, oh, Lord, no. Uh, and uh, in fact, let me, uh, to explain my position on capital punishment, let me, let me tell you that I am not a Witherspoon excludable. Now, a Witherspoon excludable is a juror whose positions on the death penalty tend to be uh, pro-life uh, uh, and cannot truly be fair to the prosecutor's arguments for the death penalty. In Witherspoon versus Illinois in 1968, the Supreme Court said that somebody who merely had conscientious scruples against the death penalty uh, could not just be uh, removed uh, from a jury for cause. Uh, and the court then used the definition that uh, anybody who would uh, automatically vote against capital punishment could not serve. A few years later, the Supreme Court clarified that in the case of Wainwright versus Witt in 1985 and said that any prospective juror whose views on capital punishment would prevent or substantially impair him 
uh, from being fair uh, in accord with his oath and his instructions cannot serve. Well, I, I could serve on a capital jury, and if Josh convinced me that the defendant uh, committed a serial murder and tortured people, and the proof was there beyond a reasonable doubt, although I would prefer beyond a conceivable doubt in death penalty cases, uh, I would most certainly vote uh, to convict and in favor of the death penalty. Uh, and so I have, do not shed a tear at all for these killers. Uh, I'm not particularly concerned about whether there's a last minute reprieve for John Muhammad. I'm kind of rooting against it. In fact, I have a bet on it at Delaware Park. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my position is that, in fact, that I'm not surprised that a Democrat would support capital punishment because if you want a good example of the most wasteful and ineffective, uh, a benefit-free government program imaginable, it is our current government program on capital punishment. It's extraordinarily expensive, uh, and contrary to these studies, which appear periodically by economists, and I'll explain why their research is so horribly flawed, uh, there is, there, the death penalty doesn't have any superior deterrent effect to life imprisonment without parole. In fact, let's do some common sense. Uh, we don't even need studies to know that. Now, does the death penalty deter murder? Of course it does. But it's always a matter of comparison. Uh, if the question were, does the death penalty deter murder that better than a $100 fine? My first question several years ago when I quarreled with my chair would be, where do I pay and where's Bob? <laughs> you know. <laughs> But, but what will the death penalty deter better than life imprisonment without parole? Of course not. Only rational people, and this is one problem with economics, though it's a great field. I disagree that it's the dismal science, as some call it. I never said that. Uh, but they tend to look at models that assume rationality. No rational person would ever take the position, well, I'm going to go ahead and kill my spouse for the insurance money because if I get caught, I'll only get life imprisonment without parole. I'll only get. I mean, th th there's this notion somehow among people that if there are two different punishments and one is more scary than the other, that the scary one deters better. Nonsense. If you had a choice between uh, your punishment being 500 years or 100 years in hell, I'm sure you'd choose 100 years in hell, but believe me, either one would be enough to deter you. If you weren't eating lunch, I would use the example for young males, since you're the most likely to commit a murder, that if you had a choice of a punishment between having your eyes poked out or your testicles squeezed into a little mush, uh, one of the two might scare you more than the other, but I assure you that both would be enough to deter you. No rational criminal capable of being deterred would ever say, I'm willing to commit the murder because they will only get life without parole. On the other hand, people on the fringe of sanity, uh, people who feel the typical murderer, who feels betrayed, humiliated, dishonored, uh, the victim of a vast conspiracy. For him, the message of an execution, especially a highly publicized one, is imitation. The message is that violence is an acceptable way to resolve the problems with those who do us wrong. And in fact, the best scientific evidence indicates that if anything, executions have a slight brutalizing effect and actually lead in short-term studies to a slight increase in the homicide rate. So not only does it not deter, but if anything, it makes us less safe. Uh, and uh, so my position is basically that a true conservative who wants cost-effective programs that will work uh, should oppose capital punishment. Uh, moreover, uh, I want to point out that uh, the problem with the death penalty is people. Uh, I support the death penalty. Uh, Josh says it's a question as to whether or not uh, you can morally oppose capital punishment. I have no moral opposition whatsoever to capital punishment. Uh, I think it's absurd to say that it's immoral, unless it's based on your uh, true religious beliefs. But uh, the, the question is, uh, does it work? Uh, and as we'll see, the answer is no. Uh, I support the death penalty in principle, but not in practice. And the reason is that ever since Eve bit that apple, uh, which is Roy Adams' fault, uh, <laughs> we've, human beings have been, as Nietzsche said, all too human. We're morally and perceptually fallible. Capital cases, all criminal cases, will always be plagued by cases of mistaken eyewitness identification. 
coerced confession. Well-meaning police and prosecutors who get caught up in what Jerome Frank said was the pursuit of victory over the pursuit of truth. It's a classic psychological process. You have one theory of who did the crime, and the first bit of evidence tends to support it. Uh, the police, the prosecutors tell their spouses, their friends, we got the guy, we got the guy. Then they tend to ignore any evidence to the contrary. Case after case that comes to the US Supreme Court, we find situations like that. Well-meaning people thinking they're doing right are the ones who are constantly screwing up and making errors. The death penalty history has shown from ancient Babylon through the Roman Empire through today simply cannot be administered by human beings without substantial error, substantial caprice, a uh, tremendous waste of money, and a great deal of racial, gender, and class bias. It just can't be done. Uh, Dr. Ross, why don't we stop there and let Fair enough. Mr. Marquise respond, and then we'll let you come back. Okay. Five minutes, right? Oops, Roughly, so, yeah. okay. Um, Professor Haas has presented a classic conservative, uh, which is if you don't, if you, you know, how do you like the TSA? If you don't like the TSA and the Department of Motor Vehicles, do you really want the, the same institution deciding whether people should be executed? Probably not very positive. Um, but, the, but the idea that we, and, and Professor Haas has actually articulated what is the most recent argument against the death penalty, which has gone beyond the moral and frankly now beyond sort of the innocence issue uh, to the cost issue, which is highly relevant in, during this enormous recession where so many other things are needed, education, health care, et cetera. The fact of the matter is the reason it costs so much is because we give people due process. The only way to save money would be to withdraw that due process, which would be wrong on every level. And frankly, not only do murderers deserve due process, but anybody we're going to lock up for long periods of time deserves due process. I am outspent in Oregon 20 to 1 when I try a capital case. Now, I know that's not the conventional wisdom. The conventional wisdom is the threadbare but plucky public defender coming in with the battered briefcase and the district attorney sleek with these three or four assistants sweeping in on a limo. You know, that, that, that happens in, in, in John Grisham novels and on, on, on TV and movies, uh, but, but not in real life. Um, the, the death penalty is a very specific deterrent in one way. Uh, Ted Bundy is not raping and murdering any more people because Ted Bundy is dead. And, and in states like Michigan, for example, which have not had the death penalty since 1858, has one of the very highest murder rates. One of the problems is you have people in prison doing life in prison, and what do they do? They murder other people in prison. They other prisoners, they murder guards. Senator Dianne Feinstein tells a story about when she was uh, on the parole board in California, and it was a woman not charged with murder, but uh, robbery. And she was asked, well, you had a gun, but the gun wasn't loaded. Why did you do that? And Senator Feinstein tells, the woman says, well, you know, I know California's got a death sentence, and I did not want to carry a loaded gun because I didn't want the chance for that to happen. Is murder a rational act? Rarely. But look at, uh, is, it a, is it a crazy act? Yes, in one sense. The, the crime that, that, that were, the, for which the execution may happen tomorrow, John Muhammad was an incredibly calculated, premeditated crime. Ten people were, were murdered and three were, were gravely injured. Uh, I ask you to think in your mind in terms of justice, is there any crime, the, the murder, torture of a child, the killing of, uh, of, of a large number of people, I think we can all agree the Supreme Court is right. Retarded people should not be executed. People with serious mental illness should not be executed. Juveniles should not be executed. So then the question comes down to, are there any circumstances and what is the alternative? Life without parole. But then I would warn you, the sentencing project run by a guy named Mark Maurer, very well-funded, very articulate guy. In fact, I was just on a panel with him at the ABA. Uh, they came out with a pro uh, project called No Exit in July of this year, in which they call for the abolition of life without parole. Uh, I debated Nadine Strassen, who is the head of the, used to be the president of the ACLU for the United States at the ABA convention just before 9-11. And I asked her, it's available online, um, I said, look, uh, you know, I really, and I meant this sincerely, if I could be absolutely convinced that someone would be locked up for the rest of their life with no possibility of release, I would probably be willing to give up my support of the death penalty. But I need to know, as the head of the ACLU, will you agree that life without parole does not constitute a violation of the Eighth Amendment, that it is not cruel and unusual punishment? And she gave me a very honest answer. She said, nope, can't do that. It's an evolving moral standard. So, 
One of the reasons that a lot of cases don't go to trial, and I can tell you this as a practitioner, both as a defense practitioner for a relatively brief time and a prosecutor for a longer period of time, that many, the only reason many cases are resolved is that the specter of the death penalty is over them. Now, any prosecutor that uses that when it's not appropriate is committing a grave violation of office. And one of the reasons that it takes so long is that we have layer after layer after layer of appeal. And the reason we know about many of these cases where mistakes were made, and mistakes were made, no question, is because we, the man, for example, I have on death row has had committed his crime 22 years ago. And there's not really any, any real issue about whether he did it. The issue is whether the jury can answer all 48 questions yes, which is what Oregon requires before someone's put to death. Let, let Dr. Marquise respond now. W. <clears throat> Dr. I mean, sorry. <laughs> yeah, excuse me. <clears throat> uh, just, just made a very good point. Uh, and I almost wish I were debating uh, Nadine Strassen uh, because uh, it is true that uh, when we abolish the death penalty that uh, people uh, on the far left, mainly Democrats, will uh, in fact argue that life without parole is cruel and unusual punishment. In fact, at this very moment, not, well not quite this very moment, but the Supreme Court is hearing oral arguments today uh, in two cases from Florida, the argument being that it violates the Eighth Amendment to sentence juveniles to life imprisonment without parole. Uh, uh, what I think is going to happen, though, is that it, when the court looks to uh, objective standards of decency, it's going to find that the vast majority of states do permit the sentencing of very, very serious juvenile offenders to life without parole. And therefore, the court will probably find, although you never know, that there is, is no contemporary consensus uh, against that practice. I think once we get rid of the death penalty, which is an illusory remedy, a symbolic remedy that makes the people feel safer than they are, uh, that we can then get to the serious issue of determining what kinds of punishments are most, the fairest and the most retributive punishments for various kinds of offenders. Now, by the way, uh, Josh is doing a great job, but words have meaning, and we have to be careful how we use words because they lead to ideas, and ideas have consequences, some good and some bad. It is simply incorrect to say that the death penalty has a specific deterrent effect. Specific deterrence refers to the ability of a punishment to intimidate a living creature with free will from doing something he otherwise would do. You can't specifically deter a dead person. You can't specifically deter this podium. He means to say incapacitation, of course. The death penalty does have an incapacitation effect, but the death penalty does, does not have the, a specific deterrent effect. Uh, it, it, has, it does not have a general deterrent effect. Now, what about that incapacitative effect? Uh, it is true. Uh, a study of the inmates whose lives were saved by the Furman versus Georgia decision did show that among those who stayed in prison, four of them committed new murders. Uh, however, the, those who got out did very, very well. Uh, most, the vast majority, never went back to any crime. Uh, it is true that there are some people who uh, will kill again in prison, and some who are even clever enough perhaps to escape from prisons. Uh, but uh, that's another thing we can work on and maybe have the money to do better once we get rid of the death penalty. Uh, because believe me, a society that can send people to the moon, darn well ought to be, out, be able to figure out a way to keep dangerous people in prison and keep them from hurting anybody while they're there. I know we can do it. Other nations do it. All of Western Europe has abolished the death penalty. When they get those kinds of offenders, they get life without parole. Uh, they rarely hurt anybody else. It can be done. Uh, and it'll be easier to do that. It also always amazes me that the very same people who talk about uh, the, uh, the, uh, who downplay the, the incredible number of errors that are made in capital cases will uh, play up the kinds of errors made by parole board officials and prison officials that lead to releasing people who are truly dangerous or allowing people to escape from prison. This is the problem. Human beings are all too fallible. We constantly screw up and it will always be that way. We can't trust ourselves with irreversible punishments. And it's for the notion that we provide due process to death row inmates, nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, we have one of the strangest appeal system in the world. Uh, take a look at the case Herrera versus Collins. In that case, the Supreme Court uh, agreed to decide two issues. One, does it violate the cruel and unusual punishment clause to execute an innocent person? Well, the court couldn't answer that question, finding it too difficult. 
I find that easy to answer. Uh, executing an innocent person is, is certainly the gratuitous infliction of pain and suffering with no good coming out of it. Uh, five justices in the various uh, majority concurring and dissenting opinions did take that position, but that does not an opinion make. The other question was whether or not a death row inmate could bring a freestanding claim of actual innocence if he didn't also have a procedural claim, a grand jury error, an exclusionary rule error, a Miranda rule error, and by the way, I'm opposed to the Miranda rule. Uh, and the answer was no. Actually, Rehnquist's answer was first no, and then maybe. If a truly persuasive case were shown, then perhaps we could do this, but the standard would have to be extraordinarily high. The result is that we have an appeal system now by which murderers often have their death sentences or convictions reversed because T's weren't crossed and I's weren't dotted. Meanwhile, people with actual uh, reliable uh, cases of innocence, new evidence of innocence, don't, aren't allowed to appeal. And this has worsened since the passage of the 1996 Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act. Uh, what kind of an appeal system takes away largely the opportunity to make a claim for the truth to bring up evidence of innocence and instead ask us to mainly consider, did we get the procedures right? Did the police officer make a search error which a court found five to four that he made wrong? Absolutely absurd. There is virtually no due process in these cases at all. We need, among other things, to change the appeal system to allow death row inmates and all inmates to appeal on the basis of innocence and not on the basis of procedural technicality. So we need to move away from that. So why don't we give two more minutes to each speaker and then we'll open it up for the audience. <clears throat> The, I, I would agree professor, with Professor Haas that the idea that executing an innocent person is not a violation of their most fundamental rights is, is, is ridiculous. But I will also tell you as a practitioner, this is not, no offense to Professor Haas, my father was a professor, an academic exercise for me. I, I live in a relatively small county. When I make the decision to seek the death penalty, I meet with the victim's family, and I stand as close as I do to Professor Haas to the person of whom I'm seeking to ask that the jury to kill that person. So this is not academic. It, it, it is very real. It is a decision that I don't think I am special among prosecutors in taking it incredibly seriously. Um, so it, Professor, uh, Professor Haas has said, well, it, it really doesn't do any good because human beings are fallible. Yes, they are. How do psychologists will tell you that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior? But that doesn't just apply to individual, it applies to institutions as well. And Professor House might even agree with me on that. And, and in my state, until 1994, when someone was sentenced to life in prison for murder, it meant eight years. When someone was sentenced to 20 years in prison for forcible rape, it meant three years. It's ridiculous. Um, and so voters passed mandatory sentencing laws that actually meant that a rapist, someone who grabs a 12-year-old girl off the street and violently rapes her, gets eight whole years in prison. If I, if I made a wild guess, now the fact of the matter is, when we take away eight or 10 or 15 years of a young man's life, that is in many ways also an irrevocable act. And why do we do that? Do we do that because we think it's gonna make them a better person? That they're gonna get cured of their pedophilia or their, their incredible anger towards women? No, we do it, and I think Professor Haas and I may actually agree on this, because retribution is different than revenge. Retribution is a reasoned moral response to a terrible wrong committed against both an individual and against society. And for the same reason that we deprive someone of their liberty for molesting it, repeatedly molesting children for 10 or 15 years is the reason that in some very few cases, and I ask you to think to yourself, is there any case, whether it's the Nuremberg war crimes or Ted Bundy or perhaps some other awful case you've heard that you say, well, I'm really not for the death penalty, but that person, that person deserves to die. Because if you answer that question, yes, then you have crossed the, that, that Maginot line or that Rubicon and, and, and you've answered the question about whether the death penalty should be. Then the question about how we make sure that there are as absolutely few mistakes as possible is very important because Professor Haas is right, there will always be mistakes. Justice is a work in progress. We are never doing it perfectly, any part of it. Professor Haas. Okay. Um, well, um, 
I wanted to just, I brought some materials just to give you some examples of some, some typical events in a year in the life of the death penalty in 2009. Uh, one of the more interesting events that caused a little bit of a furor among the defense bar and the prosecutorial bar was a new study by the National Research Council, the National Academy of Sciences, which stated, uh, and this is the most prestigious scientific research organization in the country, with the exception of nuclear DNA analysis, no forensic method has been rigorously shown to have the capacity to consistently and with a high degree of certainty demonstrate a connection between evidence in a specific individual or source. Fingerprint analysis, large element of human interpretation in the fingerprint analysis, uh, tool, mark and, tool mark and firearms identification, uh, because not enough is known about the variables among individual guns, we are not able to specify how many points of similarity are necessary for a given level of confidence in the result. Microscopic analysis of hair. Uh, the hypothesis that microscopy can individualize a hair source has no scientific support. Bite mark evidence, even worse. Uh, the defense bar was exultant, of course. Uh, prosecutors were upset, but the best answer, and the one to which I agree, was provided by Josh Marquis, who said, a quote, the next week in the National Law Journal, and he couldn't be more right, quote, uh, the science of this has been tested over and over again. The problems are not with the science, but with the people who apply it. Exactly right, the people. Uh, these mistakes are extraordinarily common. Uh, and uh, we have to realize, I've seen some uh, arguments on the death penalty that uh, the cases that go wrong it's the same principle as the press will not report on all of the planes that land safely, only on the very few that crash. When it comes to the death penalty, what's really happening is that uh, the vast majority of death penalty cases are systematically flawed and go wrong in one bizarre way or another, and it's not reported on very well by the media, and the people don't know about it. Uh, if, uh, how much time do I have? Maybe 30 seconds. A few other quick events. Uh, in October, a new study showed that in the 39 states where judges are elected, state judges, the research shows that these state judges are more likely to impose the death penalty when they have elections looming. Well, wonderful. Uh, some, of, <laughs> some of you may have studied the 2009 Ohio Supreme Court decision, Disciplinary Council versus Stewart. Well, what happened there? Well, the judge in Ohio sentenced a man to death and wrote his order. And the prosecutor in the case ghost wrote. <laughs> The order for him, the prosecutor wrote secretly. The judge and the prosecutor conspired secretly, and the prosecutor wrote his death sentencing order. Well, in disciplinary counsel versus Stewart, the Ohio Supreme Court took a strong stand, gave the judge and the prosecutor a public reprimand, and they promised not to do it again. Uh, so let's end there. And that's, I have many more I can go on. Just Google well, the death penalty bizarre that. errors, millions. <laughs> So we want to have about 10 minutes of question and answer. Feel free to ask any question. I might let both speakers respond to each question, even if you address the question just to one of them. Uh, yeah, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Professor Haas. Professor Haas. Haas. Sorry, Mr. Marquis. Uh, so we focus in on uh, this issue of unavoidable error because we're all human. Yeah. Um, and to what degree is the issue of, does that apply to either the issue of executing innocence or providing a stronger deterrent? You seem to move between both in your analysis of human error. I'm, I'm wondering for you which issue is more important. Well, they're, they're both very important. When it comes to deterrence, the one thing research has shown now for 200 years is that certainty of punishment is far more important than severity of punishment. In other words, if you have 100 murders and you only catch one murder and you give him uh, you know, the worst type of execution imaginable, that won't have much of a deterrent effect because most murderers will correctly know they, they're not going to get caught at all. In fact, research at Krishna shows they don't even begin to think about the severity of the punishment until they're arrested. Then they want to know what the punishment is uh, and then try to get a good plea bargain, of course. Uh, and so I think the two issues are, are separable. Uh, the, the problem with the errors, uh, I don't think, it, in fact, you know, even if we have a lot of errors, that, we get, the more errors we have, that would mean the more executions, and that might uh, increase the deterrent effect. Uh, but, but that just would be an inhumane thing to do. Uh, it, it's a rarity comments. I often joke with my students, like, my goodness, why are you complaining that uh, you should uh, have a sentencing hearing? You had a fair trial. You were unlucky enough to have a fair trial. Not a good trial, not an excellent trial, but you got a C trial. 
Uh, there were no major errors, uh, any small errors were subject to harmless error analysis. Now you, you have a video that you were in a last of 500 miles away from the scene of the crime. Why be insisting? Take one for the team. Take one for the team. The victims will be happy. Uh, they think you did it, so they'll be happy when they're executed. Uh, there'll be deterrent effect to, to that there is a deterrent effect because nobody will think that you're innocent. And so take one for the team. Uh, so I think the two issues don't come together. Uh, and I think the best way to achieve deterrence is to use the money wasted on the death penalty and use it to, let's solve cold cases. Let's improve forensic laboratories and move away from these incredible errors that are being made. So in the case of Todd Willingham, where modern arson investigators said, there's no way this was an arson. Uh, the original investigation that condemned him to death for that arson murder was absurd. They said they found patterns of the devil in the fire burns. Uh, and uh, what did Governor Rick Perry do? Uh, immediately fired the Forensic Science Commission that's investigating this and appointed his old friend, the head, who promptly canceled that coming meeting, which was bringing in the best arson investigators. And what those were the Roger Coleman case to me was that before they finally showed the Roger Coleman murder, the state prosecutors in Virginia fought and fought against doing that new DNA testing. What were they afraid of? What are they trying to hide? Did you want to respond in any way? Yes. <laughs> Uh, uh, I got to get one thing in about the about the judges that are elected or more likely. Ring versus Arizona. Some of you hopefully know about that. Supreme Court case says, guess what? Judges don't get to impose death sentences. Juries have to do it. So judges can judges in this state in this country now can overturn a death sentence, but they cannot impose one that a jury has not approved. But to answer your question about the possibility of errors about. There's a, a study called the Liebman study. Uh, originally came out in the mid-90s. Professor James Liebman, Columbia, showed roughly two-thirds of all capital cases overturned. And the thesis was, my god, two-thirds of the cases overturned. That must mean that there are errors rife throughout the capital system. So, but when you start looking at the individual cases, are they because they are these, uh, again, Grisham-like situations where a ro person ro is wrongly accused? No. It's because of the level of due process we apply. The one case I've got on death row, the issue that returned the case to, was that the victim was allowed to get up, the victim's family was allowed to get up on the stand during the penalty phase and tell the jury a little bit about what Rod and ha Lois Hauser were like as human beings. Not what they wanted to see Randy Guzik dead. But, and the Oregon Supreme Court said, well, you know what? The statute says that you can do that in a shoplifting case, but it doesn't specifically say that you can have victim impact in a capital case, and therefore, we're going to reverse it. And by the way, you're going to have to do the trial all over again. Um, the, the fact of the matter. Let's go on to the next question. Okay. Let's make sure we get some more in. Can I respond to that? Uh, OK, very briefly. OK, all right. well, Josh misstated Ring versus Arizona. Uh, it is not true to say that Ring versus Arizona says that only juries can impose the death sentence. In fact, Ring versus Arizona allows several states, including Delaware, Indiana, uh, Alabama, Florida, uh, the jury simply plays an advisory role and votes, not unanimously, 9 to 3, 8 to 4, 7 to 5, 4 against the death penalty. The final decision is made by the judge. Uh, and in the states that have that system that's been upheld, held under ring, uh, and uh, the law, most of those laws say that the uh, judge is to take into very strong consideration the jury's recommendation, but the judge makes the ultimate decision. So ring at this point stands only for the proposition that a jury must be involved in some way in the trial level sentencing process, not that they can't uh, actually make the final trial level decision. Okay. Yeah, let's, uh, by the window there. Well, I guess the, I, I don't want to be flip, it would be sort of like an alcoholic, one is too many and, you know, a thousand is not enough. Do I, I have to be honest, if you have the, a, a death penalty, is there a possibility an innocent person will be convicted? I would, I would say yes, there is that possibility. I don't know, the Willingham case has many, many aspects to it, not all of which have been fleshed out in the New Yorker. The question comes down to basically, and this sounds harsh, but it's what Professor Sunstein talks about, cost-benefit analysis. Uh, you, you are more likely to be killed by your pharmacist than you are to be wrongfully accused of a felony in this country. 44,000 of you will be killed by medical errors this year. Uh, 
So the, the point that Professor Sunstein makes is when we know that there are hundreds, maybe thousands of people, innocent people, who will die, who will be murdered because we don't do it, can you afford not to do it? But to answer your question, yes, I think there is a possibility, and it's a very disturbing possibility. Do you want to say anything in response to that? No. no. Okay. Can I have some more questions? Yep. In the back there, to the right, yes. Can I answer that? <laughs> you can both answer that, okay? I, I, Briefly. Okay. I'd like to talk about victims because one of the great points that Josh made was that it's so important to remember the names of these victims. Uh, one point Josh makes in a recent Law Review article co-authored with Paul Cassell, a mutual a friend of his and acquaintance of mine, is that just the defense part of the Timothy McVeigh case uh, cost $13.5 million. And uh, what was that for? Uh, 13.5 million just for the defense. Was that a good use of government money? Timothy McVeigh, uh, John Ashcroft uh, uh, arranged for a closed circuit TV viewing of family members of the 168 victims who wanted to attend. Now here we're going to execute a guy who killed 168 people and he referred to the children as quote collateral damage. What did the death penalty do for him? Uh, what it did for him was give him a chance to come out and smile and smirk. Most of those victims left that closed circuit fe hearing feeling worse than ever. Uh, and the death penalty often makes these people into celebrities. Uh, they get fan mail. Uh, they, they often smile and taunt their victims in the execution chamber. Uh, and uh, the idea of this closure is the most overused word by people in support of the death penalty. The social science research shows that executing the offender of some, uh, uh, the murder of somebody's loved one does little or nothing uh, to bring back a sense of joy and freedom. Uh, and the, the way to handle these things is the way Judge Brinkema handled the case of the 20th hijacker, Zacharias Musali, in sentencing him to life imprisonment without parole. The last word she said to him before he left the courtroom was, you will die with a whimper. There was no smirk at that point. That's how we need to deal with these kinds of killers, not with the death penalty. Mr. Marquis? Um, closure never happens. I never use that word. And by the way, again, this is not academic for me. I sit down. I have, I have in fact, waived the death penalty because uh, families have said to me, we do not want... Uh, I've taken this into consideration. It's my decision. I'm the gatekeeper. But if a victim, I, under the Oregon Constitution, and I, I fought for this to be in the Oregon Constitution, prosecutors must consider the wishes of victims. I would, my guess would be, having done this for 19 years, about 75 to 80 percent of the victims of capital cases, in fact, do want the, the, the killers of their loved ones executed. Do they get closure from it? No. Uh, they get some degree of finality from it, which they don't get uh, when the person is in prison for the rest of their life. Um, but I, I, I want to point out, because I, I do know Professor Cassell, um, and, and one of the re what Professor Cassell did is he sued the Department of Justice because the, the, the court system in the McVeigh case was so numb to the victim's wishes that they refused to make access to many of the victims in the McVeigh case uh, who did, couldn't, didn't have the money to travel to Denver where they'd moved the trial. So Professor Cassell sued them so that they would have to set up so that they could at least participate. And I can tell you from being there that it, the, the, the trial process, frankly, no matter which way it comes out, is an incredibly cathartic process. And the most amazing and eloquent things I have ever heard are the victim impact statements in both capital and non-capital cases. And, I, and I, I stay in touch with these people over the years. And, and they often say, I am so glad I had the chance to say that. And this is really respective of both capital and non-capital. We have about five more minutes. So we have time for one or two more questions yeah, against the window there. Well, I'm about to litigate that very issue. There's a professor named Wanda Fulia who goes around the country testifying that there is no way 
to write a to have a death sentence or a death me mechanism which can is workable in which a jury can understand. And of course, guess what? Professor Folia and her supporters oppose the death penalty. You can create a, a Rube Goldberg me mechanism that is so complicated, so difficult, so hard to under understand, so hard to implement that it is the functional abolition. Um, in Oregon, you you have to answer four questions. The jurors all have to agree, was the murder in t not merely intentional but deliberate? Did the victim do anything to provoke it, mainly to prevent um, battered women from being subject to the death penalty? Um, is there a strong likelihood that the person will commit future acts of serious violence in the future? The state, by the way, has to prove these first three questions beyond a reasonable doubt to all 12 jurors. And finally, just an open question. Should the death sentence be imposed? Are there mitigating factors that argue against it? And, it, and if there's 47 yeses and one no, the death penalty is not imposed. As, as much as one can create a mechanism, I think it's probably as close to fair. I'm sure there's a better way to do it. I'm not sure I heard the question, but was it about the American Law Institute recently declaring that uh, it, it withdrew the capital punishment section of the model penal code? Yeah, that, that, that study came out in October, and quote, uh, we, we're going to withdraw it because of the currently intractable institutional and structural obstacles to ensuring a minimally fair system for administering capital punishment. Uh, and nothing could be more correct. Uh, Josh is correct, by the way, about the imp cathartic importance of a trial and victim impact statements. And another ideal example of how to proceed is Colin Ferguson, the Long Island Railroad shooter who killed six people and wounded 19 others in a 1993 shooting. This is before New York embarked on its ambitious death penalty experiment and spent uh, $60 million and never executed anybody. And there was no death penalty at the time. So he quickly went to trial a year and a half later. Uh, he was found guilty. The victims gave tremendous testimony and told him exactly what they thought of him and what he had done to them in their lives. And then the judge sentenced him to life imprisonment without parole. He's never been heard from again. He no longer is a celebrity. Uh, the victims have been able to get on with their lives. Once we get rid of the death penalty, that's the way we'll handle things, the same way every civilized nation does. Uh, and we're going to use that money properly. We're going to increase the certainty of punishment uh, and do what the Na uh, National Association of Chiefs of Police just said in a recent report. When asked what is impeding the effort to fight crime, 20% said uh, uh, lack of police resources. 20% said drug and alcohol. 2% said insufficient use of the death penalty. And also this conservative group, the Association of Chiefs of Police, when asked, is it true that uh, politicians use the death penalty to uh, distract uh, people from the real causes of crime and how to really deal with it? 72% said, yes, that is true. Now these are uh, chiefs of police, those liberals. Uh, the consensus is becoming clear. The death penalty is a dying institution, and it's only a matter of time before we follow the rest of the civilized world in this regard. Why don't we do this? Um, for 30 seconds, I'd like each of the speakers to sum up, if you want to, uh, starting with Professor Haas and then with Mr. Marquis, uh, and then we're going to take the vote. Just 30 seconds. Okay. Well, uh, the death penalty uh, inevitably leads to error, caprice, racial discrimination. The famous Balda study showed uh, in uh, Georgia showed that even after the changes brought about by Furman versus Georgia, out of every 100 cases where a black was convicted of killing a white, all other factors held equal, 22% got the death penalty. When a white killed a white, 8%. Uh, when a white killed a black, 3%. When a black killed a black, 1%. So, uh, white kills a, a black kills a white, 22% get the death penalty. Black kills a black, 1% gets the death penalty. Same results in every state that has been studied. Uh, Jack Boger study in North Carolina, a uh, study in California, Ray Paternoster study in Florida, uh, in Maryland. Uh, we simply can't continue to have an irreversible punishment where we know we will make some mistakes, uh, where we waste a lot of money, and we inev invariably commit horrendous racial prejudice. Got to get rid of it. There is, in fact, a more recent study than the Balda study called the Cornell study, which came to an exactly opposite conclusion, that, in fact, a white murderer charged with aggravated murder was twice as likely to be actually executed, and for the incredibly politically incorrect reason that, for whatever reason, white people tend to commit worse murders than black people. It's very hard to think of a black serial uh, sex murder. Um, the fact of the matter is, you have to ask yourself, is there any case 
in, in which the death penalty is appropriate. I recently did a, a, a salon uh, in a group where 90% of the people were against the death penalty, and I said, well, most of you in this room are, and, and elites of our society are, and they said, why is that? And, and I grew up in an upper middle class, and my own parents are against the death penalty. And I said, you're not going to like the answer. The answer is that, unfortunately, that most of you have never, and thank God, hopefully will never be touched by the kind of horrible crime and violence that occasions the need for the death penalty. And I would ask you to reflect on the fact of who is the victim of murder. A, a black man in this room is seven times like, more likely to be murdered than I am just because of the color of his skin. The overrepresentation in murder is unbelievably high for women, children, and people of color. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank both of our speakers for very informative, engaging. Now it's time to pretend like we're in merry old England. If you think Professor Haas won the debate, go this way. If you think Mr. Marquis won the debate, go this way. Thank you very much.